Hi guys, I hope you had an awesome weekend and you're excited to learn a process called integration by parts. So turn your books to 9.2 or just follow along and we'll go through the notes together. Now in 9.1, we learned how to use something called integration by substitution. Now what that did is it helped us to find the antiderivative of a function that was formed by taking the derivative using the chain rule. Now it was a super helpful formula. It's a big um, development in calculus. However, it doesn't always work. If your derivative was found using the product rule or the quotient rule, if you start with integration by substitution, you'll very quickly hit a wall. It's just not gonna work out. What will happen is you'll be able to identify an f of x and a g of x, which is great, but then when you find the derivative of g of x, you won't be able to match it with the other pieces. Okay, so when you have the product rule and quotient rule that were used to get your function, we have to use something that is called integration by parts. And so what happens is they're gonna give us another big formula. Now notice, you still find two functions, okay? If they are side by side, unless it's a natural log, the first function is f of x, the second function is g of x. And you might be saying, well, what about the natural log? There are a few examples and I'll explain that when we get there, okay? But again, thinking of like a product rule, first function f of x, second function g of x. If we're looking at the quotient rule, the top of the fraction is going to be our f of x, the bottom is our g of x. Now what you have to do is identify those two pieces. Now here's where it's gonna get a little bit different. Notice we have our capital letter, which means antiderivative. We have the antiderivative of g of x this time. We have the derivative of f of x. So it's gonna be opposite of what we saw in integration by substitution. Now we'll be taking the derivative of f and the antiderivative of g and then filling it into this process. So without further ado, let's just go for it. Okay, so if I look here, I have two pieces. They both contain an x. Okay, so if I go ahead and I identify what is f of x and what is g of x. f of x would be the first piece, so it's x. g of x is e to the power of x. It's the second piece that contains a variable. So just think kind of um, back when we were doing derivatives, when you had to identify your pieces to um, do a derivative using the product rule, okay? Same idea. Now you find the derivative of f of x. The derivative of x is just a one. And trust me, you will get really excited because if this is a one, it means you only have to do integration by parts one time. And again, we'll have some examples where we will have to go through this process more than once. And that occurs if this ends up not being a one or something that we can simplify further. Your antiderivative, the antiderivative of e to the power of x is e to the power of x plus c. Now when we use the formula, we don't put the plus c back in because notice you're putting the antiderivative here and here. The plus c is important to have for your final answer, but we're not going to write the plus c all the way throughout our, our work and the process that we're going through. Okay. Here is the first part. You take the original f of x times the antiderivative, and again, don't worry about c. That's only needed at the very end of the problem. So x times e to the power of x is x times e to the power of x minus the antiderivative. Now you take your derivative of f of x, multiply it by g of x again. Don't worry about the c. Technically, it has to be there because it's an antiderivative, but you don't use it in this process. 1 times e to the power of x is e to the power of x, and it's a dx because we are going to have to go ahead and find an antiderivative here. So you have to state that you know that this was a derivative. x e to the power of x minus the antiderivative of e to the power of x is e to the power of x. Now for your final answer, you have to make sure that that C is there. So this is integration by parts. Okay, and I know the first couple are gonna look pretty tough. We'll get used to it, okay? I'm just gonna go ahead and throw the trigonometry in right away versus doing 
day one without trig functions, day two all trig functions. What I did is I just mixed them up this time. Think of the product rule. This contains an X, this contains an X. I can go ahead and identify F of X and G of X. F of X is X. G of X is the sine of X. Now we need the derivative of F of X, that's a one. We need the antiderivative of the sine of X. The antiderivative of the sine of X is a negative cosine of X plus C. So here are your first four points. Now I'm going to go ahead and use the formula. So if I look at the formula, I take the original f function times the antiderivative of the g function. So it's x times a negative cosine of x. So negative x times a cosine of x. I just took the x times the negative 1 to get the negative x. I have a cosine of x. Minus sign. Antiderivative take the derivative of f times the antiderivative of g. 1 times a negative cosine of x is a negative cosine of x dx because I have to go ahead and integrate. I can take this negative out front because remember this is like a constant multiple rule. This is the same as a negative 1. So negative x cosine of x, if I bring the negative out, negative times a negative, this is now a positive antiderivative of the cosine of x dx. The antiderivative of a cosine is a sine. So negative x times the cosine of x plus the sine of x plus c, and you're done. Let's look at another one. Now this one is a little bit crazy, okay? This one... Um, you look at it and you probably want to automatically do integration by substitution. So this is the one I'm going to go ahead and show you why it wouldn't work. Okay, If I was doing integration by substitution, my f of x would be x to the power of 8. My g of x would be x plus 5. The derivative of x plus 5 would be a 1. Well, I can't turn a 1 into an x by just multiplying by a negative sign or a number. So that's where you would hit that wall and it doesn't work. So when that happens, then it's to look at this and say, okay, there's two different functions being multiplied. So think back to that product rule. This has an x and this has an x. It is okay for your g of x to be this whole thing. So f of x is just x. g of x is x plus 5 to the power of 8. That is totally fine. Your derivative of f of x is 1. Your antiderivative. You add 1 to the exponent, making it a 9. Divide by 9, which is the same as 1 over 9. x plus 5, we added the 1, so it's a 9. And then we go ahead and look at the derivative of the inside. It would only be a 1, so it would not change anything. Plus c, because technically it's an antiderivative, so I need this. When I work through the process, though, I don't worry about this. But it is needed here because otherwise it's technically not a correct antiderivative. So you state the plus C, but you don't use it. You just have to make sure that you have your plus C here and for your final answer. All right, so if I'm doing integration by parts, the original f of x times your antiderivative. If I take x times 1 over 9, I can write it as 1 over 9x x plus 5 to the power of 9 minus the antiderivative. I'm taking the derivative of f times the antiderivative. 1 times 1 over 9 is 1 over 9. x plus 5 to the power of 9. I have to integrate this. That's why I need dx. This is a constant. I can bring that out front. So 1 9th x times x plus 5 to the power of 9 minus 1 over 9, antiderivative of x plus 5 to the power, sorry, I jumped ahead, um, to the power of 9 dx. Now, when I go ahead and I find my antiderivative, that's what I tried to jump ahead and do, you're going to take this 9 and add 1, so it's going to become a 10. Then you divide by 10, which is the same as multiplying by 1 over 10, x plus 5 to the power of 10, the derivative of the inside is just a 1, so it's not going to change anything. Now, this is getting ready for your final answer, so don't forget about your plus C. 
Now we simplify it however we can. The only thing I can do here is multiply those two terms together. Top times top, bottom times bottom. So I have 1 over 9x times the group x plus 5 to the power of 9 minus 1 times 1 is 1. 9 times 10 is 90. x plus 5 to the power of 10 plus c. So as you're seeing, as we um, go through some of these examples, it can get a little bit wild, okay? I know some of you guys, your, your favorite phrase is, this doesn't look right. I guarantee you, a lot of you are gonna look at an answer like this and just say to yourself, holy smokes, this doesn't look right. But it is, okay? So just know that as you're working through these problems, your answers are gonna look pretty funky, okay? We're gonna go ahead and do quite a few more because I just want to make sure that you've got it. Now remember earlier I said that if your derivative of f of x is a 1, it's kind of a good sign. It means that you don't have to do integration by parts twice. Well, number 4 is going to show you an example of something where we're going to have to do integration by parts two times to get this to work. I have my two different pieces so it starts off the same. f of x is x squared. Awesome g of x is the sine of x. Now the derivative of f of x, that's a 2x, perfect. The antiderivative of a sine is a negative cosine of x plus c. So right now you would already have four of your five points, which is awesome, okay? Now if I go ahead and I look at this, my formula says I have to take the original f of x times the derivative. So I can take negative times x squared and I can make this a negative x squared out front of a cosine of x. Minus antiderivative. If I multiply these two together, because remember it's your derivative times your antiderivative. Negative times 2x is a negative 2x cosine of x, sorry, dx. This negative 2 is a constant, so it can come out front. So negative x squared times the cosine of x, negative times a negative is a positive, 2 is out front, but I can't bring out an x. Remember, you can bring out a constant. A constant is a number. You can't bring out a variable. So x is still there times the cosine of x dx. Now again, I could not use substitution method for this because let's say this was my g of x. If I find the derivative, it's a 1. Well, that doesn't work. If this is my g of x, if you find the derivative of cosine, it's a sine. That's not a sine function. So you have to do integration by parts again. In order to integrate where you have two functions, they both contain an x, you have to start all over. So f of x, the first term, is an x. g of x, the second term, is a cosine of x. The derivative of x is 1. The antiderivative of a cosine is a sine of x. Okay, so you have to keep in mind this is all the same. We just had to do integration by parts again in order to integrate the second piece. So I still have negative x squared times the cosine of x plus 2. But now to find this, I am doing integration by parts using my new four pieces of information. So I take the original f of x times the antiderivative, so it's x times the sine of x, minus the antiderivative, the derivative of f of x times the antiderivative, one times the sine of x is the sine of x, dx. So again, it's just integration by parts within integration by parts. This 2 has to go to both pieces, okay? Negative x squared times the cosine of x plus 2x sine of x. Now, the antiderivative of a sine is a negative cosine of x plus c. So when I bring in the 2, it's 2 times negative times a negative. This is a positive 2 times the cosine of x plus c. Now, don't worry about taking out what they have in common. You are going to actually leave your answer just like this. Your final answer would be negative x squared times the cosine of x plus 2x times the sine of x 
plus 2 times the cosine of x plus c. So again, that was a wild one. And let's just say that you're looking at these right now and you're really confused. There is a Zoom call tomorrow where we can do some live together. Cool thing about YouTube, you can go back and rewatch these videos as many times as you want. But please take advantage of the Zoom call if this is confusing for you. Okay, another thing that I said right away as we were starting the notes today. If you have a natural log, that has to be f of x. The reason why is because we only have a derivative for a natural log of x. The derivative of a natural log is 1 over x. We don't have an antiderivative of the natural log of x. So if I were to set this as g of x, in order to do this process, you'd have to be able to find the antiderivative of it. We can't do that. So anytime, if you have a natural log of x, 100% of the time, your first move should be to say, okay, natural log of x has to be f of x because we find the derivative of f of x and we do have a derivative for a natural log. That would make g of x, x squared. That's the one exception to where you have the first function is f of x, the second function is g of x. That natural log changes the rules a little bit. Now if I go ahead and find the derivative, the derivative of a natural log of x is 1 over x. The antiderivative of x squared, I add 1 making it a 3. Divide by 3, which is the same as multiplying by 1 over 3, plus c. The formula, you have to take f of x times the antiderivative. So I'm going to take the natural log of x times one third x cubed minus your antiderivative. Now we have to multiply these together. So check this out. This is pretty cool. One over x times one third x cubed dx. You can simplify this, guys. Um, this is kind of how the book writes it. I do like putting the one third x cubed in front, natural log of x. These two things mean the same thing. Remember, if you are multiplying, you have that commutative property. You can put in whatever order you want. Now here, this one third is a constant. A constant can come out front. So what I have left is one over x times x cubed. You are multiplying fractions, so you can seriously just cross cancel. I can cross off 1x here, take my x cubed, and what I'm really doing is finding the antiderivative of x squared. Okay, so again, it was the derivative of f of x, which is 1 over x, times the antiderivative, which is 1 third x cubed. 1 third is a constant, so it can come out front. What I was left with then was 1 over x times x cubed. You can cross cancel one of the x's, making this just 1 times x squared. Now I can move forward. 1 third times x cubed times the natural log of x minus 1 third, the antiderivative of x squared. I add 1, which makes it a 3. Divide by 3, which is the same as multiplying by 1 third. Don't forget your plus c. Last step, I can go ahead and simplify these. So I'd have 1 third x cubed times the natural log of x minus top times top, 1. Bottom times bottom, 9. x cubed plus c. At this point, hopefully it's getting a little bit easier for you. I know it's a lot of steps. It really, really is. Now, number 6 is the first one we're going to look at where we do have a fraction. So this... This function was created by doing the quotient rule. So when I'm doing the antiderivative, you have to go ahead and identify f of x and g of x the same way that you would have with the quotient rule. The top is f of x, the bottom is g of x. So for number 6, f of x is x times e to the power of x. Again, it's okay to have a chunk like this. That's what's on the top. Now g of x... This is on the bottom of a fraction. So g of x is x plus 1 to the negative power of 2. Remember, if it was on the bottom, it means that its exponent was negative. Your derivative of f of x. There's two terms with an x in both terms. You have to use the product rule. Product rule. We keep the first term the same. 
times the derivative of the second term. There's the first piece. Plus, keep the second term the same, times the derivative of the first piece. Now, when you look at this, product rule is where you take out what they had in common. Both pieces have e to the power of x. If I take them out, what I have remaining is x plus 1. That's what your derivative is. And just notice that all of these things are coming back because this is the last chapter that we have to do for this course. So you will be doing lots of different variations for integration as well as derivatives throughout this entire chapter. Antiderivative. I add 1. If I add 1, it's negative 1. So what I'm doing is dividing by a negative 1, which would put the negative out front. The negative 2, remember, I added 1, so it's a negative 1, times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of the inside would be a 1, so it's not going to change anything. So I have my f of x, my g of x, the derivative of f of x, and the antiderivative of g of x. Okay, so I have all the pieces. Now we go ahead and integrate using integration by parts. Step one, I have to take the original f of x times the antiderivative. So what I did here is I said, okay, this is a positive times a negative, so it's a negative. x e to the x would go over x plus 1. And this is a negative, so it puts on the bottom, but it's just a 1. So if I took these two things and I brought them together, this is what I would get. Minus antiderivative. If I look at the antiderivative, I am taking these two pieces together. So again, positive times a negative is a negative. I have e to the x, x plus 1 on the top, x plus 1 on the bottom, because this has a negative exponent. So again, positive exponent top, negative exponent bottom, positive times a negative is how I got the negative. Now the negative can come out here because it's the same as a negative one. That can cancel that, you guys. So it's kind of nice. Check this out. Minus x or negative x e to the x over x plus one. When I bring the negative out, negative times a negative is a positive because I could cancel the x plus 1 on top and bottom. It's just the antiderivative of e to the x dx. And I got to tell you, Courtney and Lexi, I know you're giggling right now. <laughs> Don't think you can hide it. All right, let's keep going. Negative x e to the x over x plus 1. I swear I can hear you giggling in my heads. Okay, the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x plus c, and we need to move on from this problem. And at this point, you are done. Okay, number seven. Now, number seven is one where, <laughs> where they are going to trick you. Is that terrible? You guys can give me the giggles and I don't even see you. And you two, you know you're laughing. I know you are. Okay, number seven. Number seven, they are trying to trick you. They only have one function. And we don't have an antiderivative of a natural log of x. That's why anytime you have a natural log of x, you have to say that's what f of x is. Because we can find the derivative of it, but not the antiderivative. So for number seven, what you are actually doing is you are saying that the natural log of x is the same thing as taking the natural log of x times one because you have to have the two separate parts. I can't find an antiderivative of a natural log of x because we don't have that. But by turning it into this, I can go ahead, f of x is the natural log of x. g of x is what? The derivative of the natural log of x is one over x. The antiderivative of one, remember it'd be like one times x to the power of zero, if I add 1, it would be 1. 1 divided by 1 is 1x, so it would just be x plus c. Now I can do this. So I can take the original f of x function times g of x. So it's x times the natural log of x. Now I go ahead minus the antiderivative. I'm going to take these two things and combine them. So this is going to be 1 over x times x dx, just like... Our previous problem, you can cross cancel this. You're multiplying a fraction. There's an x on the bottom, there's an x on the top. 
So I have x times the natural log of x minus the antiderivative of 1. x times the natural log of x minus the antiderivative of a 1 is just an x plus c. And again, don't look at this and say, oh, I can divide out an x. Yes, you can, but you don't have to. Don't do more work than you have to. This is your final answer. Okay, but let's say, no, we're just going to go ahead. Just leave it here. <laughs> Resist the urge to take out what they have in common. Okay, last question, and then I'm going to go ahead and let you try some on your own. If you are struggling with this, I'd love to see you on a Zoom call tomorrow. Your suggested assignment is to try 16 questions. It's 1 to 31 odds. You'll find those questions on page 430. Every problem you will be using integration by parts as integration um, by substitution from 9-1. They're not going to work. You would end up hitting that brick wall on every single example. Okay, so integration by parts. 1 to 31 odds, Zoom call tomorrow where we can do some together. Let's go one more. This is a quotient rule, okay? The reason why I'm thinking of it as a quotient rule is because, hey, we have a fraction. So you start off the same. F of X is whatever's on the top. G of X is what's on the bottom, but it's on the bottom, so it's E to the negative 3X. This was on the bottom of a fraction, so it means that it has a negative exponent. Derivative of f of x is 1. Yay! It means we won't have to do integration by parts twice. Antiderivative. Now, antiderivative of an e term. You keep the e term the same. So e to the negative 3x. Now you take the derivative of the exponent, which is negative 3, and you would divide it, which is the same as multiplying by negative 1 over 3. It's an antiderivative, so you have to have plus c. Here we go for our final question, final answer. f of x times your antiderivative. Now, I like to multiply the x with the negative one-third. So it's negative one-third x e to the negative three x. If you wrote them with the um, multiplication sign, like you put x times this chunk, it's the same thing. I just like to go ahead and multiply them together. Minus antiderivative. 1 times your antiderivative. Well, 1 times negative 1 third is a negative 1 third e to the negative 3x. Because I have to find an antiderivative, that's why it's dx. This is a constant. Bring that sucker out front. Negative 1 third x e to the negative 3x. Negative times a negative changes that to a plus. 1 third's coming out front. Now it's just the antiderivative of e to the 3x dx. Now we already integrated this because if you recognize this, this was our original g of x. So we just have to integrate it again. Negative 1 third x e to the negative 3x plus 1 third. It's an e term. So you keep the e term the same. Take the derivative of the exponent, which is negative 3. Dividing by negative 3 is the same as multiplying by negative 1 third. At that point, I have completed the antiderivative, so I need my plus c. I can simplify this by multiplying these two fractions together. Your final answer would be negative 1 third x e to the negative 3x. Positive times a negative is a negative. 1 times 1 is 1. 3 times 3 is 9 e to the negative 3x plus c. And guys, I hope you had a great time today learning integration by parts. And I know I will see some of you on the Zoom meeting tomorrow. Take care.